Hi, my name is Kyle Burke, and I'm a senior technical architect with the customer success team here at MuleSoft. In previous Friends of Max videos, I discussed what high availability and disaster recovery look like with the AnyPoint platform from a high-level perspective. With that being said, the complexities of a multi-region deployment require much more discussion than what was previously discussed. In today's video, we're going to discuss what a multi-region deployment looked like from a deeper level perspective and what considerations need, should be taken when implementing a DR strategy. With that being said, let's jump in and learn more about this topic. In today's presentation, we are going to double click into different scenarios when failures could happen and what different deployment configurations mean for each one of these scenarios. Firstly, we'll dive into what it looks like if a failure happens in a single region deployment. Next, we will discuss different design aspects of multi-region deployments that you need to consider as each one of these can be failure points. Finally, assuming that the components of your multi-region deployments are implemented correctly, we will discuss what different failure scenarios look like in multi-region deployments. Let's jump right into discussing in a bit more detail what single region failures look like. Firstly, we have our single region Cloud Hub architecture, where we have one application that has two workers, each deployed by default in different availability zones. In this scenario, we will discuss what it looks like when one worker goes down, but the other worker is still available. Keep in mind, this scenario is just as applicable if there are more than two workers deployed. When we are looking at a single worker failure in Cloud Hub, here's what would happen. Firstly, it is important to note that if multiple workers are deployed, the MuleSoft application is still available as all of the traffic will automatically be directed to the healthy node by the load balancer being used. Next, if we look at who needs to do what in this scenario, MuleSoft is the only player here that needs to do anything. This is taken care of automatically and the customer does not need to do anything. With that being said, MuleSoft will automatically restart applications in a healthy availability zone other than where the other workers are deployed. In order to ensure that the applications will automatically restart in a failure, we need to ensure that the automatic restart on failure option is selected in Runtime Manager. By default, this option is automatically selected for all applications. Also, it's important to note that in order for there to be zero downtime for your application, it must be deployed on more than one worker. When the worker goes down, the time to recover that worker is essentially the time it takes to spin up a new EC2 instance where your application will be deployed, which can take anywhere from 1 to 15 minutes. Keep in mind that this is simply the time for the worker to come back online, and the application is still up and running on the healthy nodes. Finally, if you want to be alerted that a worker has gone down, you can set up an alert in Runtime Manager for when workers are not responding. If you wish to set up an alert in an external monitoring system, you can build a heartbeat mechanism into your application that will check in with your monitoring service. In this next deployment scenario, we are adding in an on-premise component to the previously discussed Cloud Hub deployment. One thing to note is that Cloud Hub deployment here is connected to the customer's data center by a primary and secondary VPN tunnel set up in a highly available fashion. The scenario we are discussing here is if the primary tunnel goes down. There are a few things to take note of in this scenario. Firstly, this scenario can be applied to any of the network connectivity solutions provided by MuleSoft, whether it's Direct Connect, VPC Peering, or as shown here, VPN tunnels. It's also important to note that this only applies if both of the connectivity methods are the same. For instance, this would not apply if VPN tunnel was the primary and Direct Connect was the secondary or if Direct Connect was the primary and VPC peering was the secondary. Both connectivity methods need to be the same in order for this to apply. Next, customer hosted runtimes are not required for this scenario. This also could be applied to a scenario where the Cloud Hub runtimes connect directly to the customer systems via VPN tunnel. Finally, the solution described in the next slide assumes that the VPN tunnel is the only thing that went down and all of the other systems that are connecting in the customer hosted environment are available. In this scenario, we have a single VPN tunnel go down, but the actual Cloud Hub application is still running. Here, we are assuming that a customer has set up their gateways in a highly available configuration, which will allow the secondary gateway to be used in the event of a primary gateway failure. If the gateways are properly set up, MuleSoft will automatically be able to redirect traffic to the secondary gateway, which will ensure the zero downtime in the event of a failure. 
When it comes to the recovery of the primary gateway, the time it takes to recover the gateway is very dependent on the reason the gateway failed. This can range from seconds if the gateway is managed by Border Gateway Protocol, also known as BGP, all the way up to minutes if the gateway is managed by custom scripting. Moving to the ability to be notified, if there is a gateway failure, currently there is no mechanism in the AnyPoint platform to get notified in the event of the failure. But if it is a requirement of the customer to get notified, you can use an external infrastructure monitoring tool to do periodic health checks on the gateway to ensure that they are available. Now that we have discussed a couple different failure scenarios when applications are deployed in a single AWS region, let's now discuss some failure scenarios when applications are deployed in multi-region configuration. Before we talk about the application failure scenarios, let's discuss some of the design considerations when deploying in a multi-region configuration that can also cause failures. Firstly, let's discuss the basic architecture of a multi-region deployment. On the left side of the diagram, with the orange dedicated load balancer and subsequent orange lines depicting traffic flow, we have the exact same diagram as before with a single region deployment configuration. On the right side, with the blue dedicated load balancer and subsequent blue lines depicting traffic flow, we have the exact same configuration but in another AWS region. The idea being that the primary and secondary regions should be set up exactly the same to ensure proper functionality in the event of a secondary region needs to become functional. We will discuss this further in the next couple slides. One last point is that in the upper right hand corner of the diagram, there is a green global load balancer. It is important to note that this is not provided by MuleSoft and the global load balancer must be provided by the customer. As previously mentioned, there are several aspects of multi-region deployment where customers need to pay close attention when setting them up. Firstly, as mentioned in the previous slide, MuleSoft does not provide the means to load balance between multiple regions, so customers must provide a global load balancer to route the traffic as needed. Next, traffic from the global load balancer needs to be able to access the customer's VPC in the secondary region. Therefore, it is important that you ensure the firewall rules are set up in the secondary VPC in the same way as the primary VPC. It's also important to note that the load balancer name should be unique, so therefore you need to ensure that this is taken care of in your CI-CD pipeline. Similarly, applications in Cloud Hub need to be named unique, and this should also be addressed with your CI-CD pipeline. Lastly, another point to consider is that in order for applications to be available in the secondary region, your CI-CD pipeline needs to be modified to deploy the applications in both regions, and you also need to deploy the needed dependencies for those applications. Continuing on, you need to ensure that your network gateway to the customer data centers are configured in the same way as the primary network gateways to ensure that the secondary region applications have the same connectivity as the primary regions. Along the same lines, in order for the secondary applications to have access to the customer data center applications, the firewalls need to be set up to allow traffic to flow properly, and subsequently the traffic should be able to traverse the network in such a way that it can reach whatever applications it needs to connect to on-premise be them Mule runtimes or some other customer hosted applications. On top of those previously mentioned callouts, there are a few other aspects of the deployment that need to be considered. Firstly, if your applications are using persistent storage, that storage should be available to both the primary and secondary deployments or somehow two-way replicated so that both the primary and secondary storage remains in sync. Another important aspect of persistent storage is that it should be highly available. If it is not, that can be a single point of failure for the application, whether or not it's deployed to multiple regions. With that being said, MuleSoft's Object Store v2 is not available across regions, so other persistent storage options should be used. Static IP addresses, while not always used by all customers, are important to address in multi-region deployments because these IP addresses are often whitelisted by firewalls or other applications, and it is imperative that these IPs used in the secondary environment have the same access as the primary environment. Next, because you will be deploying applications to physically disparate locations, there will be latency between the different locations in the different deployments. So it's important to ensure that the non-functional requirements around performance are still met in the secondary data center. With that being said, oftentimes non-functional requirements are different in disaster recovery scenarios. So it's important that during requirements gathering, this is addressed and tested during performance testing. Finally, Auditing of both the primary and secondary 
environments is crucial to ensure that the things we previously discussed here are adhered to. The last thing you want is for someone to find out when there's some kind of disaster that happens that somehow firewall rules got modified in one environment and didn't get changed in the other. We should be proactive in this and continually do audits to check the environment configurations to ensure that they are in sync. As you can see, setting up multi-region deployments is not something that should be taken lightly, but it can be highly effective when implemented correctly. Now that we know where things can go wrong with the actual setup of a multi-region deployment, let's discuss what happens when failures happen during these deployments. Firstly, let's talk about what happens when either of the previously discussed scenarios happen in either the primary or secondary regions. If a single worker goes down or a single network gateway goes down in either region, assuming that the configuration is the same in both regions, it is handled exactly the same as was discussed before. Traffic is either routed to the healthy worker and the down worker is recovered, or traffic is routed to the healthy gateway and the down gateway is recovered. But now, let's dive into a true disaster scenario where an entire AWS region goes down and all traffic must be routed to a secondary region. One thing to note before we get dive into the scenario is that AWS has never actually had an entire region go down as described here. This scenario is very rare, but some customers like to be extra cautious. As discussed in previous presentations, there are multiple different disaster recovery deployment strategies. Firstly, let's discuss the most available and automatic strategy, an active-active strategy. As discussed before, this scenario here is that an entire AWS region has gone down, but because we're in an active-active scenario, the workers in the secondary region are up and running and ready to receive traffic. Because of this, the customer's global load balancer should know that the primary region is down and automatically send traffic to the secondary region. Meanwhile, while the traffic is flowing to the secondary region, MuleSoft has 72 hours to bring up the primary region and guarantees that the data brought back up will be at most 24 hours old from the time of the failure. Notifications of such failure should come from status.mulesoft.com, but it is also highly recommended that a customer set up a health check with the global load balancer to alert the needed teams whenever the region goes down as well. Now that we have discussed an active-active scenario, let's discuss what the failure scenario looks like in an active passive configuration. Here, again, the scenario is that the entire AWS region has gone down, but because we are in an active passive configuration, the workers in the secondary region are deployed, but not running, and therefore cannot receive traffic. In this case, the first thing that needs to happen in a failure scenario is that all of the applications in the secondary region need to be brought online and then the global load balancer should start forwarding traffic to the newly deployed applications in the secondary environment. Depending on the number of applications and whether or not scripting is utilized to optimize the application performance, the amount of time it takes for the entire environment to come online can be very drastically and can range anywhere from a few minutes to several hours or even days depending on how quickly deployments are triggered from the customer side. Thanks for watching today's Friends of Max video on multi-region deployments. As you can see, when implemented correctly, a multi-region deployment has lots of benefits, but implementation should not be taken lightly. If you'd like more information around high availability and disaster recovery with the AnyPoint platform, I suggest heading over to our documentation site, docs.mulesoft.com, where lots of information can be found. Also, for existing customers, there's additional details on the topic in our Knowledge Hub, which can be found at knowledgehub.mulesoft.com. Until next time, thanks for being a friend of Max, and best of luck with your multi-region deployment journey.